Though the War of 1812 had ended, the British government was convinced the Americans would invade again. The most vulnerable chink in their armor lay between Montreal and Kingston, where the St. Lawrence formed a narrow border between America and Upper Canada. Two American advances on Montreal had given the British quite a scare. The battles of Chateauguay and Chrysler Farm saved the day for Canada. If the Americans had gained control of that stretch of river, it would have prevented the British from moving troops and supplies into the Great Lakes system. They needed a safe supply route, and the recommended solution was to build a canal in the interior of the country. The man chosen for the job was Colonel John By, a royal engineer who had proven his worth in the Napoleonic War and who already had experience building canals in British North America. Instead of just digging straight from Montreal to Kingston, which you can imagine how long that would have taken, he saw that there were natural waterways that he could follow, and these were the routes that the native peoples were taking. Well, the chosen route um, was really uh, linking the Cataraque River system, which runs uh, to Kingston and the Rideau River system which runs to Ottawa. The challenge being in the middle, there are a series of lakes and changes in level and very wild conditions. Bai's vision was to build a slack water canal using the existing waterways. Building dams where necessary to raise the level of swamps and rivers to facilitate the movement of boats and creating a system of locks where there were significant changes in elevation. The Rideau, the Cataraki and the Styx River all formed part of this canal. Colonel Bry got all of the local people who had building experience and stonemasons that were building houses because there were a lot of immigrants who had already landed here and businesses that were already flourishing. There were mills, there were grist mills, there were logging mills, sawmills. So they used all those people to build the locks. He actually had at any one time 4,000 men working on this canal. Reenactors at Upper Canada Village in Morrisburg and artifacts and murals in Ottawa's Bytown Museum helped to tell the story. Each contractor was allocated a section of canal and given two years to complete it. And then the specifications were that they would be of a size for steamboats. He could see that steam vessels would be the way of the future. And every lock has to have a spillway or a way that that river can flow around it because no river can ever flow through a lock because one gate is always closed. The building of it and the engineering was absolutely incredible. And there are 47 locks on this canal and each individual one has its own history and home story as to how it was built. We have eight locks, we go from, uh, we go up 80 feet, so 10 feet from each lock. The large, the other locks are maybe two to three, a lot of them are just a single lock. Um, so I guess he figured out how to do it after starting with the lock system here. But it is such a beautiful sight in Ottawa to stand up above and look down on this set of locks right next to Parliament Hill. There were many unexpected challenges. When they struck a mile and a half of solid granite at Newborough, two new locks had to be added into the plan and the high water content of the clay they were using would freeze in the winter and thaw in the spring. The dams at Jones Falls and Hogs Back collapsed and had to be rebuilt. And so they had to rethink the types of mortar and clay that they were using in these buildings. Some of the other work that they were doing, I mean, cutting massive stones out to place into the canal locks and these huge beams of wood to make the doors with. This is where the royal engineers and the miners and sappers came in with their skills and their ability to actually understand how to move huge stones without breaking a man's back. Most of these stones weigh anything over a thousand pounds and to move them around you needed a block and tackle and sometimes two or three men to pull them. Dents were chiseled into the massive blocks of stone and huge pincers resembling great ice tongs were attached to the end of a block and tackle. As the men pulled on this crude form of a crane, the pincers dug into the dents and held the stones in place. The Scots tended to be the skilled craftsmen, the stonemasons, the carpenters, and the English tended to be the officers in charge of the whole project. The Irish were the unskilled workers, the navvies, and they tended to do the back-breaking work and in many cases the most dangerous work. They were often employed to handle black powder, which was a very volatile material. The offer of money and land 
also attracted French Canadians, Aboriginals and many nationalities. But accidents and disease took a terrible toll and there was no compensation. The swamps and bogs along the waterways were an ideal breeding ground for mosquitoes. It's believed that they were responsible for spreading the malaria from those soldiers who'd been infected while serving in India. There are times in the summer where work was completely stopped because of the malaria. There weren't adequate hospitals for these men. They were also just buried alongside the canal as they died from whatever epidemic had struck them down. Many of them were buried and left in unmarked graves all along the Rideau Canal, but particularly between Kingston and Newbra. Kingston Irish Folk Club took the lead, and given that there were so many Irish that died, the most suitable marker was a Celtic cross. Soon after the canal was completed, tensions changed, and the military era of the canal was short-lived. After that, the canal became a transportation route for goods, for settlement, for linking communities that had otherwise been quite remote. I think of the canals as really the precursor to railways and highways. The original uh, features, the dams, the weirs, the embankments, locks are all in their original location, uh, which is really an attestment to the, uh, the high quality of construction and design. One of the things that's very important to me is that the canal is still here and operating the same way it did when it was first opened in 1832. I think a lot of people who grew up around the canal don't really appreciate its history necessarily. It's just a part of their environment. And I think it's important to take a step back and, and really look at the people who built this and remember those who died. Originally built to transport troops and supplies between Kingston and Ottawa, and connect them to the Ottawa River in Montreal. The Rideau Canal with its 47 locks is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It welcomes boaters in the summer and in the winter is transformed into the world's largest skating rink, recognized as such by the Guinness Book of Records. And yes, the British government that followed the War of 1812 was right. The Americans frequently invade the area, only these days it's to enjoy one of the greatest recreational assets of the entire region. For more information, visit our website on topoftheworld.net.